All right, come on down, come on down. Let's get let's get together. Let's get close. Let's get this thing started. Um, let me see here. I got my notes right here in front of me. A little bit of housekeeping. You all ready for this? Oh yeah, you are coming. The last guy offered uh, twenty dollars for everyone that would come down, but I just got a I got a hundred dollar bill. If you want to split it, if anybody has change, oh. All the way. If you come all the way, that's a bonus. You get a bonus. Yep. I'm hoping that we can have a little conversation and, and have time for questions. And, and uh, we'll get through this in about 40 minutes, hopefully. I'm just here to tell a story. This is story time. I'm Will Crombie. I'm a farmer and a filmmaker and a father and all sorts of other F words that uh, we don't need to get into. Um, Maybe we will, maybe not. Uh, so I'm just here to tell a story about this journey to a regenerative system uh, on my family's land. And uh, I'm just really, honestly, I'm just lucky to be here. And uh, I'm sure as all of you are. Yes. Let's move the mic. Just right here on the, the soul patch. Just right there, direct live into you. How's that sound? Yeah, what's going on with this feedback? Check, check. Is, it, is the other microphone is off. All right, here we go. Things are interesting already. You came to the right session. We're shaking it up. That was B4, and now this is B3. You have to promise to laugh when that slide comes up. A minute here. How we doing now? We got feedback? Much better? Okay, sorry about that. It happens. All right, let's get back on track. So who was here for that last session? Was anybody here for that last session? Ah, oh, that was really exciting, huh? Isn't that great to have an elder in the room uh, that just has so much wisdom to share and, and, and is just so connected to the land? I don't think I can top that, so let's just let's see let's see where we can go with this. Um, all right, so I'm not the greatest farmer in the world. What's with this mouse picking my nose here? Hang on. But I got a story to tell. I'm really passionate about the soil, really passionate about the earth. And um, this is a, a story of family lineage. This is a, for, a story of, of discipline and, um, and just uh, community, community building and just building a relationship with the earth. And to be honest with you, the real reason I'm here is because uh, my mentor and business partner wasn't available today. So... You're stuck with me. Um, this is uh, Reginaldo Hazlitt Marroquin. He's the CEO and co-founder of Tree Range Farms and kind of our guru in this world of regenerative poultry production. Uh, he's indigenous from Guatemala. He's got a lot to share, his wisdom from the jungle all the way to Minnesota and to today. And uh, we're the crazy chicken people, chickens and trees returning uh, chickens to the forest because they're originally a jungle fowl. So uh, that's a big part of my story. And um, here's, I put this picture here because, you know, here's Ray, he explaining something to me. I just wanted to illustrate that he is, he is a great mentor to all of us. And um, we got a team here uh, of, of people that have helped build this. So Tree Range Farms is what we call the company. Tree Range Chicken is, uh, is what we're creating and we're just trying to do something better 
trying to uh, put the livestock back on the land, you know, get tree crops incorporated in farms. And, uh, you know, we use that word regenerative. Um, this is silvopasture, if anybody's familiar with, with silvopasture. And uh, we, uh, the four of us, uh, built this company. That's me there. That's Jim Kleinschmidt and Tony Wells, and there's Rahi there. Um, the four of us pooled our family's money, and, and we started this company. And I'm just lucky that uh, I had land and some skills in media and marketing. And uh, we came together, and, and, and this goofy guy got to stand in the back for that photo. So we've also worked together to create Regenerative Agriculture Alliance. That's a, a nonprofit that we formed in support of of uh, this mission to, to grow regenerative poultry production in the Midwest and beyond. And some of the team is here from RAA. So we have a booth, actually just right at the top of the staircase to the right, right? So that's perfect. Um, I don't know, why don't you guys stand up and, and uh, turn around and give us a wave. So, so there's other crazy chicken people in the room with me. Uh, I don't feel alone. Is anybody, anybody uh, raising chickens? We got chicken farmers? Okay, great. Cool. Um, let's see, where are we going from here? Uh, so this is my wife, uh, Carly Crombie, my, my daughter, Hazel Rose Crombie, and that's my baby boy, Arrow, uh, on the left there. Um, we are a uh, family that is blessed to live on the land at the organic compound. Um, so like I said, this is a story of, of community and that's the secret. So if, if you wanted to, maybe if you're looking for a more practical talk, um, you, could, you could go now because that's the end of the story, right? Building community and building culture. Um, we, couldn't, we couldn't have farming without culture that's agriculture for a reason so I, i'm i really believe in you know community and fa the family farm and uh collectivizing ourselves and and working together to to grow this regenerative movement so um this is a, a picture of our garden you can see uh two of our chicken barns back there we've planted thousands of, of hazelnut and oak and sugar maple and we've been gardening and, and experimenting with permaculture for many years. And, um, and uh, as you know, agriculture, you know, this is, this is far removed from a lot of people's lives. It took me a long time to, to, to find the garden and then to find tree crops and to find permaculture and agroforestry and, and all of that. Um, I wasn't interested in it as a young man. And um, luckily in my early 20s, I, I started to grow that passion and we started to get together on the land, bringing uh, friends and family out there and, and thus was born the organic compound. And um, a part of this story is also acknowledging where we came from. That's why I really appreciated that last talk. Um, this guy from Montana, what was his name? Mike, was it Mike? Anybody know, remember his name? It's like Durango or something. But anyways, he came from Montana and was talking about the importance of indigenous people and the use of fire and how that has influenced land. Um, so, the, Durglow, all right, there, yeah, Mike Durglow. It was great, it was an inspiring talk. And, um, and he did an, a land acknowledgement as well. We, I think we listed off uh, a, a, a lot of peoples that used to live in this, in this, on this Turtle Island. Um, I'm from southern Minnesota. So the folks that were in my region were the Wapakute. And um, I live in a town called Faribault, near, near Faribault. Our farm is near Faribault. So I just thought that this was important. This whole, this whole um, land acknowledgement is really important because the story of, of regenerating and the story of, of the organic compound isn't, isn't about me. It's about, um, you know, it's, it's about this, the seven generations. And, and the way that I look at that is, you know, the, 
the, the folks that came from came before me and the folks that are coming after me and the ways that we manage land and the ways that we have changed land and the direction that we're going is really important uh, that we consider that and we look at that as we talk about, uh, as we use this term regenerative and as we think about the future of farming. So, um, I just want to I just want to say uh, thank you to the Wapakuta people and thank you to the people of this land and thank you to to my family and my ancestors and all of your ancestors and um, for the work that all of you are doing too and for you being in your seats here and uh, it just feels good it feels good to be here right now what is it 2023 already it just feels so good to be here to be in this room to to be sharing this story and to be a part of history. And, and I like to remember that our, our ancestors' prayers, their thoughts, their actions, you know, good intention, bad intention, whatever, it was, it, was, um, it was a thought that they had that brought us here, that got us to where we are today. And, um, and I think that it's important to acknowledge that, think about that, and, and, and pave pave a way forward for the future generation. So there's a little little um, little dip into my ancestry. This is my grandmother right here. And uh, I just love this photo because she's drinking that pure fresh water right out of the right out of the spigot. That's my great grandmother, that beautiful woman right there is my great grandmother. And um, these are like my great great grandparents on my grandmother's side. So that's Colleen Colleen was her name. And look at them. They got horses, they got wagons. That is not that long ago, you know? When you think about it, it's not that long ago. So the, the farming and the agriculture scene that we look at today was just a, you know, drastically different 100, 200 years ago. And it's gonna be drastically different tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And, and it's, um, it's really dependent on the choices that we make today, so. Uh, there's grandma sitting on the cow. There's grandma sitting in a pile of, what is that? Does anybody know what that is? Yeah, a pile of wool. You don't see that very often, just hanging out in the dirt. Whoops. Hanging out in the dirt, pile of wool. Um, we got some sheep farmers in the audience, right? We got some sheep farmers. Isn't that just so great to see? Um, that pile of wool and just to think about how how folks used to manage land and and how we used to we used to we used to do our thing so there's another little bit of nostalgia for you that's so it's terrence crombie and, and colleen cummins uh they're the crombie side of the family and the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree that's grandpa terry and his daughter that's me and my daughter just another photo to really illustrate and send home that we're all just people, right? And, and uh, Terry was a gar an avid gardener and he started this uh, greenhouse manufacturing company and uh, he's a beautiful guy. And my mother's side of the family, uh, the Bowers, you know, so German farmers, I guess it literally translates to uh, farmer. Uh, they, they were uh, settling, I guess there's a, a thing called the, the German Triangle, and uh, folks just really gravitated towards this area in the Midwest. And uh, I guess my family uh, were one of those. You, you remember phone books? Does anybody remember a phone book? So if you open the phone book in my county, the B section goes on forever because there's just copious amounts of Bowers. And uh, they, they were settling in this area. Apparently that's a truck. That's what a truck used to look like. Um, and that's my great grandfather. He was born in like 1876. Here he is dead in 1963. Um, <laughs> I was hoping you would laugh, but maybe it's too morbid. Uh, <laughs> um, it's just, just further illustrating you know, where we are and where we've come from. Hang on one second. I got the dates here for these, these aerial photos. I just got to pull them up. Here we go. 1938. 
This is, this is my family's land in 1938. Um, this is one of the original homesteads right there. This is uh, what we call our upper field. This is our pasture. And this is the lower field. This is Prairie Creek. So there's a little waterway there. there. And it's really fascinating to me to, to look at these aerial photos. This is the oldest one that I can find. And just sort of wonder what they were doing and even wonder what was going on even before then. Uh, so this is, this looks like maybe it's fall, they were tilling and, um, and they were haying down here. I was told that this is a peat bog. This was a peat bog originally. Um, here we have a picture from 1954. And if we keep progressing along, 1964, you can see uh, the lines got straighter. Look at that, the fence post got straighter. Uh, mechanization came on a lot stronger and, and it looks like they converted that lower field to to corn which it's really wet down there um, so I know why they resisted it for so many years and we're just haying it um, because that shouldn't that right next to that waterway that shouldn't be in in annual tillage and, and production um, but machines got bigger and uh, the times were changing. So uh, here we are in 2013, fast forward 50 years. Look at that wood, woodland now. All of a sudden, the, the cows have been removed and uh, the forest grew in its wake. Um, and you can see that we continued year after year to do annual production on here. And uh, here we are in 2016. Um, and that's our homestead, and that's still in corn production. But this is the year that we took it over. We started the tree range farms business, um, you know, and, and we started implementing this, this concept of regenerative poultry up here. We built our first barn. We started building our first barn. We have this line, this whole sequence uh, where we uh, have, have the, had the plan to build these barns. So we planted thousands of, of hazelnuts on contour on this upper field and just straight lines here for the poultry production and we were experimenting with you know deep mulch gardening and permaculture in this area and the story goes on this is a, a picture from 2021 you can see now we have tree crops and if you contrast that with the 1938 photo You can only imagine uh, what this is going to look like in another 50 years. This, this is going to be thick, a thick forest. And you can only imagine what it used to be. Um, and to me, that's very exciting. I, I just love that culture. I love that history. I love dreaming forward into the future of farming. So um, fast forward to me and my family in the 80s. In the 90s and early 2000s when I was raised. Uh, here's me with my socks and sandals and my frosted tips. Uh, there's grandpa, he was a dairy farmer, and mom and dad, they bought that land from, from, from uh, Helen and Wilford Bauer. And clearly I didn't want anything to do with farming, you can tell by my attire. And, uh, and I was lucky to be raised um, on this site and I was really lucky in my early 20s to get to rent it and years later to purchase it and to now be part of that generational story uh, stewarding the land. Um, here's some pictures of us building the homestead. Uh, here's here's uh, you know me thinking about slam dunks and Michael Jordan and uh, you know riding my bicycle. You can't tell but there's Tupac is uh, on the back screen there. I got a little little bling in my earring. Um, I wasn't. I, I I was a country boy, so you know we went mushroom hunting, and me and my brother uh, horsed around in the fields. But um, I wasn't raised as a farmer. But luckily, I made my way back to it uh, in the form of a lot of black plastic wrap. Uh, but my my knowledge and the community continued to gather out there, and we continued to co-create and. Um, transition this land we took on more more acreage this is like 3.14 acres we called it our slice of pie 
And this is where we started uh, experimenting with permaculture. And you can see us planting like a three sisters garden and doing like these hugel culture mounds on contour and just, you know, keeping bees and planting tree nurseries and just gathering as a community on the land. And it's a beautiful thing. These are some pictures of us transitioning the land in 2016 to agroforestry. And here we are building our first regenerative poultry production production unit, this chicken barn. And uh, this is uh, when the trees were so tiny that we needed artificial shade. And this is our, our first barn where we're, you know, rotating the chickens under the tree crops or under the developing canopy, that is. But we always had Rehi as an example, his history in the jungle and his, his test site at, on his homestead um, where he already had a full canopy where this vision came from, right? Uh, in the alleys, we were experimenting with garlic and we planted uh, 2,000 asparagus in between some of these tree rows. I think for like three years, we were doing the garlic and we're like the biggest garlic farm in Minnesota. And we had just, I, I don't know how, we, we had no idea what we were doing. We're, I, you know, like I said, I'm not a farmer, um, but we just did it. And I think that's the most important part of, of my story uh, is, is, you know, community and just the collective power to work together and just move forward and progress. Um, and we were married to the land. My wife and I got married on the land. Here we are in what was that pasture? is now forested thick with honeysuckle and buckthorn, of course, because from generation to generation, grandpa had his beef cows out there. Mom and dad were homesteaders, not farmers, you know, hunting and fishing. And, and their idea was to rip out all the fence posts and let nature take it back. But you know what happens when you just let nature take things back? A lot of the invasives come in. So now it's our job to bring goats out there. We've been bringing goats out there for the last two years. We've been, we have a dream of, of working with the Dorper sheep with Wilbur here and, and you know, bringing this back into a civil pasture kind of environment and, and helping to eliminate these invasives. So next generation, new, new concepts come on like holistic grazing and, and land, you know, different concepts of land management. New invasives come in and it's just interesting that generational perspective and, and, and it happens so quickly. And I'm really lucky to have witnessed this growth in my lifetime, to have that understanding, to be able to pass down that wisdom to the next generation. Um, so we're moving ahead. We're, you know, we're continuing to plant tree crops. We're continuing to raise chickens. We're continuing to uh, bring on more farmers into the brand. Ray, he got his own farm. I think he's got a hundred acres. He, he, Bought 100 acres, but I think it's he's since sold off some parts. Well, how many farmers do we have in the network? 13? 13 farms? Somewhere around 13 farms raising, you know, regenerative poultry production, raising tree range. So we're, we're, we're making waves, it, you know, in this, in our region to work towards uh, something different. And we're building this brand and we're bringing people out there and we're talking about it. And, uh, here we are in the grocery store and in the restaurants and in the farmer's markets. And here's some scientists coming out to do research. People are, are, are starting to get interested and we're building this movement with the brand, with the nonprofit, um, you know, on, on my family's land. Uh, this summer we had a TV show come out, Zoe Bakes. She baked some cookies for her TV show on the Magnolia Network, which is really cool. And we're really blessed and honored to continue to have folks come out for, you know, concerts in the lawn and our garden gatherings, come to our community garden and share this story. And um, look at, you know, uh, this is 2016, we planted it. Now all of a sudden these, uh, these hazelnuts are beasts and, and we're getting a yield. I brought some with me if you, if you wanna sample some, come down here at the end and I'll let you try some of these hazelnuts. Um, we're, we're hand harvesting. Uh, throw in the best parties of your life, you know, the best, the best time you could ever have, get together and just grow food and, and harvest together and sing songs around the fire. I think, I think we need to get back to that and um, get back to working with our families. And here's, 
here's little Hazel, my daughter. She's the next generation. What is going to be her story? You know, she's going to school me somehow. There's some mistakes that I'm making for sure. Right? There's mistakes that we're all making. And um, there's improvements that we're all making. And, uh, you know, we're just really lucky to be here. And I'm really lucky to have Hazel and to have this family land and have this team and, and have this vision. I'm lucky to have met, uh, you know, a mentor like Rahi and other mentors in my life and to, um, to be sharing this story with, with all of you. And uh, with that, um, I want to say uh, organiccompound.org is our website. Uh, you can learn more about the regenerative poultry production at regenpoultry.com. You can also go to regenagalliance.org, learn about how you can plug into the nonprofit. And um, I encourage you to follow us on social and to um, ask your questions. How are we doing on time? How are we doing? We're doing so good on time, even with the mic snafu and everything. So we, how much time do we have? I nailed it, didn't I? No, I'm seven minutes fast. Maybe a little nervous and talking a little fast. I was trying to leave 20 minutes because I got a couple of videos that we could play. We could open it up to questions. We could line up and sample some hazelnuts. Um, the video's ready to rock, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so let's play let's all right so let's play this there's, there's a clip there's a nine minute video it's kind of a recap of what i just went through um but it's from the savannah institute the savannah institute features featured us in this partnering for agroforestry series um and it'll dive a little bit deeper into and you'll be able to see it and um yeah rock on Let's do it. Hi, I'm Will Crombie. And I'm Carly Crombie. And this is the Organic Compound in Faribault, Minnesota. And we're partnering for agroforestry. We're really lucky to have family land that we're here farming on. We have 42 acres of mixed agroforestry. One of our primary crops is tree range chicken. So that's the brand that we raise regenerative poultry for. And we also have hazelnuts, oak, sugar maple, elderberry, and a bunch of other woody crops on the land. So our parents helped us overcome the one of the biggest challenges to even implement agroforestry is land access. We were able to partner with our family and get the support to you know, plant our dreams out here with these trees from the gift of, of land access and from Will's parents wanting to be able to, to work with us and to regenerate this little parcel of, of, of earth with us in those ways. And the other layer of our partnership is the, the fact that we have three other business partners that co-founded Tree Range Chicken with us. So, so startup capital is huge to be able to not just be coming from one family's income, but those four partners really becoming pillars for the company um, and not having to be too much weight on just one individual. It was the first farm to scale up this concept of regenerative poultry production, which our business partner, Ray Inaldo Hazlitt Marroquin, has been developing and studying throughout his lifetime. And we've been a part of that journey of bringing about um, regenerative poultry production brand. So the basis of our farm partnership story, our partnering for agroforestry is the fact that we had business partners that helped us get the startup capital. We had family land. And from there, we planted it out, started building the brand and increasing the production and the agroforestry on our land. The food brand wasn't going to have vested interest in this land forever. Eventually, the transition needed to happen to mm -hmm. Carly and Will. So now we're taking over that lease and we're taking over the farm as, as individuals, as mm -hmm. farmers. Farmer owned instead of like business owned. So now we're going to be paying back the, the infrastructure. We're going to be paying back for the barns and the well, but at a much lower cost. It's a really good deal for us. So I don't know if, if, there, if that's a model that other people could follow, if there's a way that farmers can partner up front with brands and with food businesses like we did, I think it's a really interesting partnership model. And I think that those are two key elements that hold a lot of people back is the startup capital or operating loans or, you know, a lot of people have to go through banks and then having land. So those two things have been such a blessing and a gift to even <clears throat> make this possible. Mm -hmm. 
and we we weren't farmers like before all this we right so education is another huge piece is mm -hmm. like having the the wisdom and the education to implement some of these practices and maybe part of it when we started off we would have done different now you know being like five years in and um mm -hmm. learning as we go but we've planted thousands of trees and sometimes now is better than later <laughs> So one thing that makes our partnership successful is that we had also done the work to to build a strong community, uh, found like our foundational community that helped support us in getting the trees planted when we did the tree planting and uh, all throughout this journey over the last six or seven years. Especially during harvest time is like our biggest community event and we really invite everyone out here to see the farm in full fruition and to help us harvest nuts. We're not mechanically harvesting yet, it's all by hand right now. So to have the community support, support to even make this work is huge. Having a strong alliance with your local community and creating those experiences for other people to come out onto your farm and be a part of those harvest days and to get their hands on the land is I think it's really empowering for people yeah. to see themselves. As part know. of the solution, they're very much like making a physical impact by the way that they're showing up, they're out in the field, they're feeling very included in, you know, the regeneration. They're very much part of like direct action people feel good about that when they can actually be out there making a difference and then you see the harvest and it it only brings the community in closer each each harvest and some people are coming out here because they want to own a farm like this too so they're getting that education they're getting that experience they're seeing the hands-on aspects of the farm so education is a big component of our farm we're hosting uh, the harvest days and garden gatherings and getting people out here on the land doing farm tours. Right, working with like local organizations like the SFA and, and you know sharing our roots and just like organizations within our community that are doing the same things and that's another like unspoken partnership I guess too to talk about is just like all the other little hubs of people that are in your same community and with the same little niche of being like oh like yeah we're taking care of chickens or we're doing perennials to so just like connect with them and see mm -hmm. which ways you can support whether it's like sharing equipment or sharing field aids and things like that. Savannah Institute sharing our story, mm -hmm. Regenerative Agriculture Alliance really fully supporting the regenerative poultry production by purchasing a processing facility. That's a huge barrier is the access to processing and, and access mm -hmm. to the equipment and the machinery um, is, is a real gatekeeper for these kind of industries to flourish. So right. I think that that's like one of the biggest partnerships is like within for all of the the little nuances of how to actually keep things functioning is is shared resources between organizations or those kind of partnerships that really like nourish and help save capital and help save like labor costs and everything like like the elderberry destemmer not every farmer needs the elderberry destemmer it's like a one-time harvest and you come out to our farm and use ours which we got through a grant at, uh, from, Another kiss, partnership. from kiss the ground and then also um the midwest elderberry cooperative mm -hmm. is is was another layer of that grant was was the reason why we got the elderberry destemmer. So like the nonprofit partnerships are huge in not only just telling our story, but equipping us and empowering and educating people. Mm -hmm. So there's that capacity to partner with the institutions and then the brands and the, to increase the production and to increase uh, the diversity on the land because agroforestry really allows for so much diversity so many different layers of enterprises can be established on, on a land like mm -hmm. there's two women that keep bees on our property mm -hmm. we've rented an alley out for Herbalist. for herb herb growing we've rented uh, our property out to other livestock owners and I would just love to continue to create space for more diversity of partnerships on our land. Somebody could build, there's space for two more barns and somebody could be managing that production or we could take that on ourselves. Um, there's just, with agroforestry, there's just an infinite, it seems, amount of ways that people can partner on land uh, to make a profit and to work together. And I think it's really important that people do that. Because Especially the people that have the land access, like people like us, it, it feels like part of my responsibility and my duty to open that up and get get it at its full potential. Like I don't, we don't have the carrying capacity to monitor or to care to steward every single 
square inch of this property, but there's so much potential for our farming friends or for like our land stewarding friends or our herbalist friends to come and use these resources here. You like utilize the community that's here, the space that's here, the physical land that's here and available to be able to share the resources that we have is a really powerful partnership on our end to be able to be the ones offering something you know, like your parents have been so generous to take care to take care of the land in the way that they are caring for it by letting us be their stewards. And then for us to extend that opportunity to people is only going to benefit our community and our soil. And as as the agroforestry further establish itself, the land only gets richer mm -hmm. and the abundance only uh, compounds and multiplies. Hey, all right. Yeah, so how do we how do we work together? How do we do this? How do we find a mic so we can ask some questions? All right, let's do it. So I can run around and pass the mic, so raise your hand if you have a question. Hi there. Um, I just had to ask, given that you've leaned so heavily into hazelnuts, um, mm -hmm. including the dedication of naming your daughter, uh, <laughs> what kind of genetics and plant like varieties did you choose for the hazelnut? These are uh, these are the varieties that are coming from Mark Shepard. So they're the the hybrid hazelnuts that he's growing. That's and what I, we I have, have to on ask because I've ordered from Mark. Are these the controlled cross or the select cross? Uh, we have a variety of both, actually. <laughs> yep. Do you have any predation problems in the hazelnuts? Somebody eating them besides you and your harvesters? <laughs> uh, so, so Birds. just being in, in the middle of corn country, I wondered that too, you know? And, and, and I actually, I hope that more animals show up and, and, and take their share, but the deer haven't been an issue with the hazelnuts. Really? The uh, the squirrels haven't been an issue. Really? Mm -hmm. They're starting to show up. The squirrels are starting to show up. It was almost like barely any squirrels on my property, it seemed like. Hmm. Um, but the blue jays are, they got wings. So they, you know, they, they, they found out real quick that these were some hazelnuts growing out there. And uh, that, has, that can be remedied through an, a little bit of an earlier harvest. They're going to wait until it's brown and they're almost falling out. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're waiting for that naturally. Um, if we can just get ahead of them by a week, then that's not an issue. I, I may have missed earlier because I didn't come in at the beginning, but what, where do you sell your elderberries? And how do you sell your elder, elderberries? The elderberry production uh, is just coming on. So we've, we've been using it for a lot of home use. But if we were to, to sell it, we would bottle it and sell it locally, sell it direct for ourselves. And that's what we have been doing on a small scale. And I've been waiting for irrigation um, to really ramp up the elderberry production out there. The hazelnuts, we were really lucky. 2016 was crazy wet. Um, and they established themselves pretty well. The gopher population was, was the biggest threat to establishment there. And um, the, uh, the elderberries, yeah, like I said, I wanna wait before I really scale that up to get some irrigation so that's really successful. Maybe some bird netting. Uh, I've, I've seen some issues. What's that? Sell it as a syrup? Yeah, yeah. bottle it as like a raw juice or, or put it into, um, some sort of remedy. Mm -hmm. um, where do you sell your hazelnuts and can you talk about the economics of it? The economics uh, of hazelnuts, um, as, so we went all in with these sort of earlier breeds, right? And we don't have mechanized um, uh, harvesting, so we're kind of on that the one of the crazy ones 
line, right? But that's why we pair this with a diversity of, of crops. That's why we have the chickens incorporated because you can start to have that diversity of income from the elderberries and the hazelnuts and the chickens and, and you can start to have it make sense. Now my wife is a massage therapist and I'm a filmmaker and a marketer. We have our income stream. If we were to look, if we were to look at hazelnuts as like just being like a sole hazelnut farmer, that math doesn't work today. Um, in, in, in the Midwest. It's coming on, the development of these varieties is coming on, the equipment is coming on, and we're sort of some of the, uh, the pioneers. But this is, you know, 50 volunteers out there just having a good time, ex having an experience. So we're in like the eco ag, or eco ag, in the, what's the word, eco tourism. We're in like the eco tourism, the educational realm with a lot of what we're doing on the farm. And, um, I think that we could get there with value added. We've been, we've been making um, hazelnut milk and then uh, using the leftovers to create a hazelnut flour and, and baking cookies with it. So my brother-in-law has a coffee company and, a, and he's starting a coffee shop in town. So we've been doing the math uh, like, okay, how many nuts do we need to produce to produce enough uh, gallons of milk to start to um, supply like a, a co like a cold brew with like local maple syrup and 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 our nut milk in it for his establishment and and the more we sort of explore that it does start to make sense especially if like our family was if if we still relied on this sort of free labor to harvest it we could make we could make some money that supplements the rest of the money that we're making on the farm, if that if that helps you sort of think about that. But I wouldn't I wouldn't go all in on on hazelnut production without the diversity of having the chickens, other livestock, and other crops and products. And it and and I wouldn't recommend selling any of it necessarily just like wholesale. You got to value add, and to value add, just like you're seeing. In, in, in the mechanization of the farm, the value add relies on the community kitchen space and the equipment as well. So farming is such a big investment, right? And, 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 to, have, and to make it viable is, is really hard and, and, and that's why we need each other. That's why we need my brother-in-law who has the commercial kitchen, who can maybe, in, and has the coffee brand, who can maybe offset some of that investment. That's why we need grants so that we can get the equipment and, and really build this industry. So I don't wanna to go too deep into numbers, but uh, I would, and I don't wanna leave anybody unhopeful about hazelnuts because I'm one of the most hopeful about hazelnut production and value adding that. Yes, so uh, when I've had chickens in a confined fenced in area, mm -hmm. it seems like they just uh, the soil, the olive vegetation, it just turns into, you know, dirt. Tell, tell us how you manage that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so where's my laser? So we have a two part, two, two paddock system that we're using. Um, and the birds that we're raising are, are around 10 weeks. It's, it's, it's broilers, you know, it's meat production that we're doing. So in any given year, we can run, I like to say three flocks, three or four flocks. We have 1,500 birds in each of these barns, right? They're, they're actually on the land for six weeks because those first few weeks, they're, they're little chicks and they're still in the barn. So during those six weeks, let's say they spend three acres, or three acres, uh, three weeks on, um, on it's, uh, it's, it's an acre and a half, right? So 0.75 acres, three weeks over here and three weeks over here, or maybe uh, four weeks over here and, and two weeks over here. However it works out, the key is to pay attention to the regenerative factors of the land. It, it depends on your climate. It depends on how well established you are. And, and, and if you're getting into trouble, um, you can always lay straw, spread some grain to sprout and, um, you can always shift them over to the other side, move them quicker. What we do is we move the feed. So every morning, I'm moving that feed to the next row. I'm not leaving the feed in the same spot every day. I'm shifting it and it's like 
it's like chicken Tetris. You know, you're just do, 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 over that week or two, do, 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 over that week or two. Never had a problem personally with degeneration of the land. Never had a problem personally with um, being like, wow, this is, we're burning this place out because we got too much heavy chickens. It, 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 and we're lucky to be in Minnesota. We're lucky to have, you know, that climate and that rain. I mean, you could, after the chickens are gone, during that break period, while well, the next ones are, are just coming out, you could go out there a couple days later and it's like you can't even find chicken poop. You know, so it's, it works. You gotta be a smart, crafty farmer. You gotta, you gotta pay attention to the land, pay attention to the chickens and do the work to, to mediate all of that though. Yep. Hi, um, my question was about the, if you have predator issues with the chickens and I, mm -hmm. I think now seeing the paddocks, like I can see that as in a fairly controlled environment rather than just a large forested free for all. So in that mm -hmm. being a smaller paddock, do you struggle with any predator issues? So we, have, so our farm is one example, right? There are farmers that are, um, are renovating, I guess the, that's the word or retrofitting current forested environments, not transitioning a hundred years of monoculture like the way that we did. And, and the whole goal and the key here is to create that overstory, that forested environment, because that is, that is how chickens protect themselves and evade the hawks, right? Um, and it's kind of like my answer about like the squirrels and the blue jays. We haven't had a significant loss of chickens in our region. And as you can see, we're still establishing that canopy. We do have um, shade, shade structures. The feeders have like a structure over it. So, and we, and we encourage people to plant like corn or sunflowers to, to create an uh, annual version of a natural canopy. Um, I have witnessed once with my eyes, a hawk out there eating a, a, a chicken and I have witnessed many times with my eyes an owl feather out there at night but that's because I left a few chickens out like when I went up there to close the barns there's a few that got into a habit of like sleeping under a bush or something and so sometimes you walk out there and you go clap your hands you know and make sure everybody's in and if you make sure everybody's in you're not going to have an owl problem you're not going to have many of the predators aren't going to be an issue because they're in that safe confined barn at night and when they're out there during the day the one th the fence protects them from the four leggeds and um, the if you have like a nice lush cover they can duck and hide from those aerial predators. And that's the concept, right? And that's how they evolved with these, you know, this, this jungle fowl, this forested creature. So they, they got their eye on the sky and they duck and cover. Yep. Okay, so we have five minutes. So I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Okay, great, great. No, you can't shout it. We got it. Uh, there's people on the live stream that want to oh, hear yeah. your beautiful voice. Oh, thank you. Um, are there opportunities to learn the chicken systems? Are these like dialed in systems or kind of more adapted to each environment? Um, yeah. How do, can people learn these this way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, regenpoultry.com, regenagalliance.org. Um, we have, we have, Folks in Guatemala and Mexico and British Columbia and South Dakota and Minnesota um, raising chickens in this way. And so we have like satellite farms and, and especially if you reach out to the Regenerative Agriculture Alliance, we can connect you with maybe people in your region. And if you take the training on regenpoultry.com, I'll see you. I'll see you on there because I got I I see everybody who signs up for that, and I'm you know I'm like Santa Claus. I can I know if you've been actually taking the training or not. So and, and we'll connect with you. What's that? In person we do we gather um, on on farm uh, at Salvatierra Farms and and uh, at Organic Compound um, and maybe some other farms as we grow. And what do we got here? What do we got? Yes. Oh gosh, you're, you're, you're trying to draw it out of me. Regenerative Poultry Convergence, March 22nd through the 24th. 
third and fourth? At Carleton College, uh, it, you know, just eight miles from this place, uh, we're going to have that in March and uh, the in-person wintertime training. If you're if you're not all PFI'd out, come on up there, <laughs> and and we'll 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 uh, do something similar, but really just focused on the economics of the chickens and the the logistics of becoming a. a regenerative poultry farmer and you know for Iowa people uh, Stacyville is where RAA has a poultry processing facility so we're really looking for more Iowa farmers for sure we still got time for one more yes um is there no fencing oh. around the paddocks there is yes and also what governs your choice of elderberries versus other fruit Bob Gordon's my 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 Special, special place in my heart for the Bob Gordon variety. I've had the most success with that variety. I guess we've tried four or five different varieties on our farm. Oh, I am taking the cues of my mentors and the elders and the people who have come before me that are saying, you know, I work with Terry Durham and, and GrowElderberries.com and he's a big mentor of mine on the elderberry front. And Savannah Institute is preaching the elderberry wisdom as well. So um, I'm just doing doing what I've been told is a, is a good direction to go. I do. I would love to do cider apples. Uh, I would, you know, black currants and raspberries and strawberries and things like that. It's all interesting to me, and I have a lifetime to form those relationships with those plants as well. So we'll see. Yes. What ground cover are you using between your hazelnut plantings, and what's what's been effective? What do you like? What would you recommend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess I didn't I didn't go too deep into the establishment of the farm, but if I had, I would have told you that that first year we did just a barley clover, and then we established the tree crops, and then the next year the clover was thick. We didn't do anything. The year after that we did like a 17 species, really diverse mix, uh, some annual, some perennial. Um, I would say, you know, an orchard grass, a clover, um, anything that is, is sort of common to your region or what other perennial farmers are doing. Obviously, establishment is a factor. You want to have a method of, of keeping the weeds back from, from that proximity of the tree crops. And there's many different ways to do that. Go to savanninstitute.org and learn more about tree crops. And, and um, yeah, it, it, it just depends. We've had luck with clover. And we've also sort of stepped back from that. And now it's just doing what it does. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we have two more minutes if there is one last question. OK. I just thought your contours were beautiful and wondered how you established those. All right, the contour story. Um, oh, they're gone. Can we get them? Oh, beautiful contours. Uh, no, it's okay. We don't have to look at them. Um, so we had a design done by Dan Halsey, permaculture designer. We had our reference of like the Beacon Schneider County uh, maps of the elevation, and we had our eyes. And we looked at those maps, and maybe, I, all right, let's cruise. Let's, let's go back there. Um, we looked at those maps, and we chose a key line, which was like this one, and we established it, and then we measured 20 feet, 50 feet, with our eyes. We didn't use a laser. We, we referenced the map, and we said, good enough. And, and we also thought about, you know, we thought about how we wanted the farm laid out. We wanted it to all sort of piggyback to this where we knew the road was going to be, where we knew the water was going to be, where we knew the power was going to be, where the, where the barns were. Um, to be established for the poultry production. So it was really convenient that that was sort of already how the contours were speaking to us. Um, and we just, we just sort of picked a line and made it and went from there. And if you, 
if you maybe look at some of our other aerial photos, I don't know, I guess I got to go backwards. Um, backwards in time. This is totally not on contour. Like that hill slopes like crazy. These should be going this way. But we just continued to replicate that pattern um, just cause uh, it just kept it consistent and um, yeah, we'll see what happens in the future. Those, those hazelnuts are doing great. They're not on contour. Probably build a pond at the bottom of it. The it's going to flow fast to it. There's a pond here that grandpa established when we built this barn. We, we, we mined for clay there. So there ended up being a pond here. We're establishing a pond here. Um, there's potential maybe we'll as we build more barns, maybe we'll end up putting another pond there. So if we're starting to move livestock through here, we've got this pattern that we can send them to. And maybe at the end of the year, we, you know, send them in into this silvo pasture. Maybe we end up fencing the whole thing. We'll see. Sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you, Will. And thank you, everyone, for a great question. Yeah.